the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19? It's not the kind of story you find in your kid's Bible. Let's see, Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, nope, not here. That might be because the main character offers his own daughters up to be attacked by an angry mob. And then in the morning, some mysterious strangers whisk him away before the whole city is destroyed. Oh, and then his wife turns into a pillar of salt for looking backwards. What's the VeggieTales episode for that one? So what's the deal with Genesis 19? Was it written so that companies could sell novelty salt shakers thousands of years later, or is something else going on? So first, some angelic strangers are taken into the home of Lot, the main character. Later, an angry mob appears at Lot's door, demanding he release the strangers to them so that they can know them, a euphemism for sexual abuse. It appears these townsfolk don't like foreigners. As a way of appeasing the angry mob, Lot offers up his own daughters for them to do with what they please. It's very similar to Judges 19, which we also made a video on. Thankfully, Lot gets bailed out from that awful decision and his family are miraculously rescued by the angelic strangers before things escalate. Lot and his children escape as the city is destroyed, but not before Lot's wife looks back and turns into a pillar of salt. Lot's wife, Salt Shakers, on sale now. So what's going on? Lot is rescued. Does the Bible endorse this poor treatment of women? At the end of this video, I'll show you how the Bible may condemn Lot without using words. But first, why would a good God rescue a jerk who offers his own daughters to be abused? One scholar has argued that sexual abuse actually doesn't feature in the story at all, and it's just a problem of translation. Well, let's take a look at that idea. You see, the Hebrew word yada, that is translated as sex, actually means to know. And so one could argue that when the townspeople demand to yada, the strangers, they literally want to know or interrogate them. In this reading, Lot is the town gatekeeper who is guarding the two foreign strangers for the night. And rather than thinking his daughters would be abused, he thought it would be more like a hostage exchange. Now, I'm not sure that's much better, but this theory suggests that Lot never expected harm to come to his daughters. Yes, Lot probably was the town gatekeeper. He's not chilling there at the start of the story for no reason. But the word yada, meaning to interrogate, doesn't add up. First, in verse 7, Lot tells the angry mob how wicked their intentions are. He knew they were up to no good. Second, in verse 8, Lot uses the word yada to describe the fact that his daughters had never known a man, as in they're virgins. Yada is clearly talking about sex. It seems very clear that Lot is willing to offer up his own daughters to be abused in order to protect the strangers in his house. Now this passage sometimes gets brought up in discussions around human sexuality. In its ancient context, the wickedness that is in view is the mob's intention to forcefully abuse the strangers under Lot's protection, and their apparent xenophobia. Their sexuality is not part of the discussion. Their intentions were wicked and to be condemned regardless of whether it was with the foreign men or Lot's daughters. Lot's suggestion is chilling, and he seems blind to the wickedness of his own suggestion. But even in the worldview of the story, Lot is far from a hero. The problem might be how we go into the story thinking about Lot. Maybe the story invites you and I to criticize Lot, just not in the way that you might expect. In the chapter before, Abraham is pleading with God. He knows God is about to destroy the city, and so he asks him, will you save the city if there are 50 righteous people there? God agrees, and Abraham keeps haggling God down. What if there are 45 righteous people? Will you save the city then? 40? 30? Abraham's out there haggling for his nephew's life like a grandma at a flea market. He finally gets down to 10 righteous people. God will save the city for 10. As the reader approaches chapter 19, they find Lot in the city that is about to be destroyed. So the question in their mind is this, is Lot righteous? There's enough in the story to indicate that no, no, he isn't righteous. But God was merciful to him and his family anyway. So why isn't Lot condemned explicitly? One medieval rabbi explained that Lot was an embarrassment for not sacrificing himself in place of his daughters. And so God's justice is for him to be a mockery in the eyes of students forever, especially when they read that his daughters later trick him into getting drunk and sleep with him so they can fall pregnant. Sometimes stories invite you, the reader, to condemn horrible actions for yourself. Think about modern cinema. 
There's a genre of movies that have been described by critics as the cinema of excess. An example of this cinema of excess is the Oscar-nominated Wolf of Wall Street. When the movie came out, critics noted that in the movie, the main character is never explicitly condemned for his drug use, womanizing, alcoholism and greed. It's celebrated, but some critics noted that by showing the excess of his lifestyle, the audience is left feeling uneasy, sick, and you, the watcher, make up your own mind about the character. Similarly, Lot is clearly no hero, and by showing his harrowing intentions, the story invites you, the reader, to think through Lot's actions and condemn his horrible behaviour for yourself. So maybe Lot doesn't deserve to be rescued, but is anyway. So when Abraham begs God to save the city on behalf of ten righteous people, the reader comes to realise there are not ten righteous people. There is not even one. But God was merciful anyway, for reasons we aren't given. In this case, towards Lot and his family. Now to the question on everyone's mind. Why did Lot's wife turn into a pillar of salt for looking back? And who looked back to confirm what happened? Some argue that Lot didn't actually pass on the angel's warning about not looking back. And so he failed his wife like he failed his daughters. Others see it in a more symbolic sense, where the importance of looking forwards instead of back has a moral meaning. Still, some claim this detail was included in the story to explain a real geological structure that would have been known to the ancient readers. The truth is, this story just doesn't give us that much detail. It's only six words in Hebrew. There's clearer details in an IKEA manual. Perhaps it's deliberately left open to interpretation. But it's probably safest to say that we can guess, but we cannot know for sure. Why don't you drop us a comment with your take on it? Hopefully reading this story as a narrative with plot and characters helped you think about it in a new way. If it did, then share this video and leave a like. I'm Lachlan and I'll see you on the next episode of Bible Unboxed.